I'm Barry Johnson, Managing Director of Solar Twin. I'm going to be doing a technical presentation about an important safety feature and innovation in solar heating called dedicated solar volume in time. It's great news for the microgeneration certification scheme, which is the British gateway for grants. This is November 2009, and this concept of dedicated solar volume in time has just been accepted onto the accreditation scheme, which is the gateway for grants. Um, if you want to look at two solar heating systems that Solar Twin do, Here's one, it's a retrofit to an existing hot water cylinder, and here's another one with a thermal store, both of which have a large volume of water going to and from a solar panel. The one on the left, referred to as Nort Nort, has the water being heated direct by the solar collector, hence the Nort, and the same water comes straight out from the cylinder, which is a Nort. The Nort 1 is, refers to one heat exchanger on the way out because there's a large mains and pressure heat exchanger. If we then move on to the explanation of what dedicated solar volume in time is as opposed to space, which is what conventional solar does, here's a diagram of conventional solar in space, and the key thing is that little E on the left-hand side, or that little energy thing on the side, the yellow plug, which is the immersion or backup heater. It's halfway up, which means you've got problems. You've got a small volume above, and you've got an unheated volume below in winter. So what Solar Twin do is we remove that and we stick it down at the bottom. That allows us to use an existing hot water cylinder and we can back that heat up all the way to the base. It's reliable, it's only about the position of the backup heater, it's not about direct or indirect heating. And the hot water convects upwards from that. Obviously the backup heating has to be on in the evening, not by day, but we do heat the whole cylinder. What I want to look at now is the myth of hot top, the conventional solar industry proponents claim, which really has to be taken apart. The left-hand side diagram is conventional solar with um, 60 degrees at the top, 20 degrees below, and that's maybe at 9 o'clock in the morning. If you then move to 10 o'clock in the morning after there's been a blast of sun, the whole lot will destratify because that solar heat exchanger at the bottom will turn over the water if it's over 60, and you'll end up with maybe 45 degrees throughout. And coming out of your shower will be unpasteurized water, water that has not ever been through a 60 degree zone. That's a myth that there's a permanent safe hot top of conventional solar heating. Whereas if you heat to the base every day, you've got safety because you're moving that, heat, that um, backup heater from the top to the bottom. So instead of having a system that's highly likely to be creating a Legionella risk according to the Water Regulations Advisory Service in UK, you've got a system that complies with the Health and Safety Executive's Legionella Guidance Power 158, which says heat to the base daily to 60 degrees. The diagram on the left heats to 60 degrees daily, but not to the base. The one on the right heats to the base as well. If you don't heat to the base, you don't kill the bugs. Here's an example of why it's so important to heat to the base in the more north you go in Europe, because the, there's six times less sun, typically, in UK in winter than there is in summer. So if you look at Danish weather conditions, which are something similar, and you take the bottom of a hot water cylinder, and the source of this diagram is Chris Lawton and others from SEN, the uh, solar committee that write about solar, you've got nearly three months of the year where you don't actually have 50 degrees even at the bottom of your cylinder. 50 degrees is the temperature which kills Legionella. So you've got nearly three months where Legionella can grow. Who wants that? Certainly the HSE don't. Um, they published guidance in um, 2003 saying if you fix a tap or a shower head and if you're a landlord in the rented sector or in a hotel or whatever, you're responsible to make sure that you comply with that paragraph to heat to the base. Why is the solar industry not heating to the base? I do not know. The key thing really is to work out is there a risk or isn't there, and here's an example, only an example, of a risk calculation. You've got to do two questions and then you've got to make some assumptions. Question one, how many Legionella cases come from hot water? Question two, what percentages of homes have solar thermal? If you've got that, you can then work out if there's a risk from conventional solar thermal, I call that DSVS, dedicated solar volume in space, um, how big would that risk be? Here are the calculations. There are 400 recorded cases of Legionella in UK and there's about a 5% detection rate of Legionella because it's a bacterium which is normally recorded not as a bacterial infection but as pneumonia because that's how it presents itself. It's a bacterium which when you inhale it causes pneumonia. So the real infection rate is about 8,000. If about half of those are attributable to hot water, there's about 4,000 cases a year in UK of Legionella attributable to hot water. Moving to the pink, STIF, the European solar trade body says there's about 400,000 square metres of solar collectors in the UK. If the average size is four square metres, then there's about 100,000 buildings with solar thermal. If 80% of those don't heat to the base, my estimate, then there's 80,000 that don't. Um, if the total number of buildings in the UK is 25 million, then a third of 1% roughly don't heat to the base. Divide one by the other and you've got about 12.8 cases of Legionella 
in solar heated homes. Not attributable to solar, just to hot water. But if you actually then put an increase in risk for solar, let's say two or eight, you then put 25 extra cases of Legionella and over 100 extra cases, depending on what your risk factor is. So there appears to be a risk from Legionella. And if you then look from conventional solar, if you then look at the issue that single figures, even maybe double figures percentages of people with Legionella actually die, and nearly always double figures are uh, percentages are actually disabled by it afterwards, you might have a problem. Because conventional solar, dedicated solar volume in space, with this dedicated volume for a solar heater only at the bottom of a cylinder, is highly likely to be creating a risk according to the Water Regulations Advisory Service. What Solar Twin does, which is heats to the base, is compliant with the HSE guidance. It's less likely to create a risk. So instead of having dubious water quality, you will have safer water. Now the question is how dubious, because the figures in those previous calculations were just my own figures. But one argument which the conventional industry has is that you actually have less performance if you heat to the base. Conventional solar has a dedicated volume which is below the backup heating, always. Solar Twin has a whole cylinder which is heated by solar by day and the backup heating goes by night. So the plumbing differences are that dedicated solar volume in space means a new cylinder, dedicated solar volume in time which heats to the base, it could have no heat exchanger or an internal one or an external one, it heats to the base. You can usually retrofit to an existing cylinder. A big benefit for plumbers and customers because it cuts cost. If you then look at satisfaction, conventional solar heating systems tend to have water that runs cool because you're only heating part of it with your backup heating. If you move the backup heating to the bottom, then obviously you're going to have more satisfaction and less of the shower running cool. And in fact, if you start looking at the figures, and I've taken the Institute of Domestic Heating Engineers paper by Dr. Chris Lawton, I've taken his figures. You look at the energy you put in and the energy you get out. So what are they? Well, the Institute of Domestic Heating Engineers don't compare like with like. And ours gives 2,000 using their figures. So how much more energy do they need? Well, IDHEE says you need 36 to 50% more backup energy. That's absolute tosh because what you've actually got is two different energy deliveries in the first place. And if you actually take them into account... There's 300 kilowatt hours more at the shower and 400 kilowatt hours being put in at the immersion heater. Well, it's all gonna, you're going to put more into the immersion heater because no insulation is 100% efficient in a cylinder. So those are the exact figures. And the Institute of Domestic Heating Engineers are basically using flawed logic to claim that you should be... With, uh, their flawed logic is that you, should be, you won't be getting efficiency from your solar heating system. And they're using flawed logic because they're not taking account of the fact that conventional solar delivers less hot water than, can, than um, heating to the base as we do. Was it peer-reviewed, his paper? No. Um, I have a colleague, Chris Wilcox, who's a member of IDHEE. He's asked three times to join Chris Lawton's renewables group, hasn't been able to do it, and he hasn't been able to review the paper. Comparing. In terms of Legionella, dedicated solar volume and time is compliant. In terms of insurance, it's more easy to insure. And we've got documentary evidence saying that it's difficult or impossible to insure conventional solar installations because of Legionella. The dedicated solar volume and time systems, you can often reuse the cylinder. That's a benefit. You get fewer cold showers. These are much less carbon footprint because you're not chucking away cylinders. It's about 20% cheaper. The energy that you have to buy in is actually only uh, 0 to 11% more. Cost benefits are therefore 10 to 20% better and it installs faster. And if the government's trying to do 7 million homes with solar and we've got a system that can retrofit in half the time and it's got better cost benefits, then it's got better potential to deliver that as well. So it's good for the microgeneration certification scheme. It's a proven approach. Performance diverge is less than 11%. The Institute of Domestic Heating Engineers may have flawed evidence against it. The cost benefits are ahead. It's safer, it's greener, it's legal, it's insurable. And the key thing is to look at not just at one aspect of performance, but total carbon, whole of life if possible. The dedicated solar volume and time approach has been included into MIS 3001, and it's great news. Thanks.